reminder, Tony is a McLaren hater. He is not... He has not come back to the fold like I have. I've worked closely with the McLaren team over the last two or three years. I'm fully back on board with Are you the back brand. On board? The, totally. After okay, that fine. Arturo experience. All right. Like mate. The 720S Spider experience, which I loved. And then the Arturo experience, which I love. I'm back on board. I'm I get what's got innocent until proven guilty in my okay. mind with McLaren. Fair. No problem. And, and I love the 765RT. So tell yeah. us all. So I got in it. Mm -hmm. Started it up. It started. Flipping hell. This is a win. It started up. Woo -woo. No key not found. It, it, it was completely fine. Started up. Nice noise. Mm -hmm. Car was shaking. Had a bit of character to it. A lot of vibration. A lot of vibration. Don't look like it's got any soundproofing at all. Maybe a little bit, but cool. No problem. So drives it out of the garage. Leaves it running for a while. All, all the guys are gathering around. We're sitting around. We then get going. As I pulled out of the driveway or the garage or whatever, we turned left out of this road. In 10 metres, I thought to myself, flipping over, it's one of the best cars I've ever driven. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And I honestly can say, hand on heart now, it's the best car I've definitely driven this year. Yeah. It is incredible to the point where I had to stop myself, I actually thought, well, that car was literally built for me. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute lunatic, yep. that car. It's, ter it's actually terrifying. It's terrifying. Yeah. It, it's, got, it's got character like a Ferrari. It, it speed like a hypercar. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly fast. The brakes... Very good. Not like that really... There's a little bit of travel. R not a really long break like the, most other McLarens have. Um, what else can I say? I, I mean, I can't really think of too many minuses. It, um, it's psychotic as it, a car. It's unbelievable. The two real things that I picked up on, one was... There is still a little bit of turbo lag from that engine. It is still a little bit... It's, it's part of that engine's character, though, I think. Maybe. Like, I, I'm not wholly against that boost feeling. I think it adds oh. to the experience. But you're right. If you're really urgent on it, you're a bit like, come on, come on, because yeah. it's so quick. But not, not, not like a 720S. Nowhere no, near no. like a 720S. It's loads more urgent than the 720S. Um, the uh, uh, and as well, I think it's because they got them stupid, really thin front tyres. Maybe the carbon tug as well. There was some. There, there was still some understeer. McLaren really suffer from understeer, obviously, and it, it was there was still some understeer. But apart from that, mate, I, I mean, I'm being so mm -hmm. so critical. It, it's definitely one of the best cars I've ever driven, for sure. And it's it's a, a car that would be really, really, really high on my list to own. And I said to you when I got out. At the meeting point. At the meeting point, <laughs> I'm going to buy one. Yeah, he literally. I said to him, oh, what, they're going on the auto trailer? He goes, oh, I've already looked. I've already looked. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to, because this car is like, like nothing I've ever driven. Mm. It's, it was incredible. And then once I'd got back and after I'd Calm down. put my brain back in gear, I realised that it was still a McLaren. As good as it was, it will probably break. Bullshit. And, <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and, and you said to me as well, if you had to pick between the McLaren and the black, initially I did say the McLaren. After I'd had some real thought about it i would still go the black series as as a whole as a car for the many reasons that the the mclaren is like 10 or zero mm. you can't mm -hmm, mm -hmm, stop mm -hmm. the it's a flipping wild animal yeah, yeah, so if yeah. you said to me you got it you got it for an hour to blast up that mountain and come back i'd have the mclaren all day mm -hmm. if if you said to me You've got to drive 900 miles 
you go and do a track day and then you come back out of the Black Series all day. <laughs> well, actually, just on sayings, uh, I mentioned Latham Steel Doors, who've been supporting us throughout this trip. They've given us some Australian slang to decode. Oh, my God. So you don't know about this. Um, let me, oh, just drop oh, a water in bottle. trouble here. Let's see how we get on here, people, because I thought it would be quite fun. I'm going to test Tony to see whether he knows what these phrases mean. I have no idea. We're going to start, so we're going to start easy. Right. A cold one. Beer. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, straightforward, so right? I'm not as so silly as I look, am I? Ankle biter. Little kid. Are these also a UK slang? Some these are of them, yeah. slang. <laughs> Cactus. Cactus? Yeah. Klingon. No, I've got dead slash broken. Oh, so, right. Something that a Latham Steel security door never is. Oh, he's <laughs> done well I'll there. charge you extra for that line. Yeah, well, <laughs> a cactus. Hard yakka. Hard yakka. Hard, got, just, it's been a hard yakka kind of day. Is that, is that, this is whole that trip has been hard yakka. Exhausted. <laughs> hard work. Hard work. <laughs> Bogan, we know, because yeah. we, we, we've, we've met quite a few of them. Um, galah? Your flaming flame, galah. Your flaming galah. I've called Tony that many times. Does that mean, like, dickhead or something? Well, <laughs> maybe not that aggressive. Idiot, right? It's a bit of an yeah, idiot. Yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> this is Latham Dawes' unofficial motto. You're going to like this one a lot. Okay, go. Jack at home. Make sure you do the right editing. We're not here to f*** spiders. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see one first. <laughs> Go on, have a stab at that. What? What do you think that means? Oh, well, I thought you said what you said. We're not literally fucking spiders. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I was going to say, I'm not doing that. Um, we're not here to mess around. Well done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm quite good at this. It's not I? too bad, right? I've done well. You've done very well, mate. Okay. When was the last car crash you had, Tony? Me? Yeah. Oh, right. Go on, let's start there. Uh, I hit a skip. You hit a skip. <laughs> <laughs> and my mate, no, and my mate nearly went through the window. It was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> but like a big, like you, you really hit a skip. Yeah. What? How long ago? Uh, nineteen ninety nine. Oh wow. Okay. What? You were thirty <laughs> <laughs> two. Forty <laughs> two. What car? It was a BMW. Uh, wait a minute. Let me get this right. E. Oh, what was before the E36? The E30? Yeah. Yeah. That okay. boxy shape. Yeah, the boxy shape. The Three, iconic M3 325 shape. 325IM Sport. Wrote it off. <laughs> Smashed it straight into a skip. Were oh, you, that's quite terrifying. I was going to say, were you aiming for the skip? Like, I was 18, mate. You were 18. I mean, okay. it was you a, on a joyride. Did you nick it? No, no, no. I paid, <laughs> actually paid for it with real money. So basically, I was driving round a blind corner. Mm-hmm. Flat out. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> things yeah. don't change, eh? Yeah, I was going to say, his driving change. style hasn't changed. It's just that I've got a little bit more control now. Then I was really clueless. Now I'm just a little bit <laughs> Obviously clueless. Obviously, you ended up <laughs> smashing into In a, a skip. skip. <laughs> and there was a big van. I couldn't tell you what van it was coming down the other way. And I have a head on with a van. I hit the skip. So I hit the skip. You mate was all right? I mean, he hurt his head a bit. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was a big imprint. I mean, I, the car was total bit. Bloody hell. Yeah. But since then, nothing... No, no, I never had another crash again since then. Paul? That's quite impressive. Paul has one a week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually here to demyth a lot of what gets talked about on this podcast. <laughs> about me, without having been able to defend myself. What, what classes is a crash? <laughs> <laughs> that fender that you had last week, definitely a crash. No, so, I mean, I've curbed a lot of wheels. Yeah, that's not a crash. I mean, <laughs> welcome to living in central London, something I know about a lot. Um, the last time one of my cars got damaged was not by me, but it was on my mum's driveway. Were you in the car? No, the car like wasn't even on. Doesn't count. I want to. I want an incident that you were involved in, ideally behind the wheel, where the car oh, needed okay, repairs. So, oh, I can think of half a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so you want to take, take your pick. I don't think he wants to talk about all of them on the podcast. <laughs> oh we'll, let, we'll let Paul choose which story. Well, it's tell. only an hour long. This podcast. We won't have time. <laughs> the one memorable crash that happened in France where I was behind the wheel. <laughs> oh yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's gonna. Be, you know which one it's gonna be. It's gonna be the sub story one. The so, one with the one with the big payout. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there was there was a payout basically. Oh, I, don't, I don't even know about that you one. So that's must seven. know this one. <laughs> Every now and again, if he sits down for a long time, he stands up and goes, "Oh yeah, I'm still my a bit stiff." Back. From, well, my I nearly got killed. Yeah, go on, tell the story. So basically, we were heading over to France for New Year's. I was in my Vauxhall Astra. 
What a whip. What a whip. First car, fantastic. It ended up in the size of, I don't know, one meter by one meter metal where it got scrapped out in France because basically... I thought you crashed it really hard. <laughs> Someone it crashed into me How'd really you get hard. Out? I pulled up into the toll booth uh, in front. I was in convoy with my brother and we were stationary getting our tickets and stuff. And then this car from behind literally slams into the back of us at, I don't know, 35, 40 mile an hour almost as if he was reading a map in front of his steering wheel and not knowing that there was a toll booth coming up. He just thought he was on the motorway. Slammed into the back of us. We then slammed into the um, back of the car in front who then went straight through the barrier. So like it was a big three car. Tony's still laughing. By the way. <laughs> and um, it was terrifying because I literally kind of realized what had happened when I like tensed up and all I could hear was like this constant horn. Now, for you two that don't play PlayStation or Grand Theft Auto... Oh, we've grown up. Yeah. yeah. Bloody hell. When you have a car crash on Grand Theft Auto and the horn just plays out, it means the person in the other car has died. Is that what, Did somebody die in your crash? So I literally hopped out the window because I couldn't get out of the door, ran back to the car behind because the horn was going off. All of their airbags went off. I was thinking I was about to see a dead body. <gasps> I was terrified, and it was a, a young family. It was a father and a father, uh, a father and a mother, and a young girl in the back of the mini countryman or whatever. Okay, all three cars fully written off. Um, we like pushed the cars into the. Lake. Were they all right? You never got. To... <laughs> Were they all right? They were, were they absolutely fine? Oh, okay. Yeah, thankfully. Thankfully, Safety my God, God. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If they were in an old mini, like they would have all been finished. Or a French car. <laughs> <laughs> or Citroen or Renault, you've been dead. <laughs> anyway, let's try and move on to some slightly lighter topics. Well, actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to move on to a Tony rant because you touched on it just a second ago. Mate, you always you, say this. People well, yeah. just think I'm really miserable all the time. Hey, you are. Oh. <laughs> okay. You called me over the weekend. Fuming. Fuming. <laughs> Mate, I cannot stand how people drive in this country. It's got worse. So go on. What, what's your big issue? Well, a, a lot of things are my big issue. Okay. But... You, you've you half touched on it. Driving in central London now is, oh. is a full-on disaster. But I was calling you about the about motorway driving because that's what I... I did a lot of driving over the weekend. I went to uh, Leicestershire, go and watch the football. Oh, hey, come uh, on, you I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about that because we lost. Got a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Your team are crap. Uh, right? Really bad, yeah. And, um, and then I went down to the New Forest because I went to see the Purasang. Oh, um, look at you. Yesterday. We can touch on that a little bit. We're not. We're going to say that because okay, I'm fine. driving it in a week. All right, let's so do that after. Talk about it afterwards. So I've done a, lot, done a lot of miles, a lot of motorway miles in the RS6, actually. Very lovely oh. on the motorway, that car. Must have been expensive. Aver <laughs> no, average 27 to the gallon. Bloody hell. Yeah. What are you doing? Cruising at 40 miles an hour? Well, I, I, even if I had a bin, I still would have overtaken all the wallies sitting on the overtaking lane the third lane so this is They're your this is your there. this was your complaint is that That's so annoying mate you believe driving stands in the uk have got worse and now on our motorways our highways our autobahns uh people are clogging up hogging hogging our outside lane which is supposed to be just purely an overtaking lane the the highway code or the rules of the roads you're supposed to be in the the inside lane you can use the middle lane to overtake the inside lane, or if you need to, you use the third lane Correct. to overtake the inside and the middle. It should all be on the inside lane, basically. But as soon as you've done that overtake, you should move back in. Correct. Now, there's obviously, you could argue that if you're uh, approaching or catching a vehicle in front of you that you're going to overtake imminently, you could stay in that far lane for the a minute pit or whatever, you know, to, to, but... If, there, if, you're, if it's an empty lane situation, if you're not actively overtaking, you shouldn't be in one of those two overtaking Correct. lanes. Correct. But in this country, everyone joins the motorway. And goes straight to lane three or four. And just sits there. Just sits there. That was a lovely time. At, at 67 or 68 mile an hour, 65 mile an hour. They're not even doing 70 mile an hour most of the time. So I was on the M1, which is one of the worst motorways for it in four lanes of traffic i was in lane two and there's people driving slower than me in lane four i mean just like literally literally mate in a complete world of their own there's like a 
a chain of six cars all in lane four, just sitting there. I, yes. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I, I was fuming. <laughs> I rang you up. <laughs> you do something about raging. Yeah. I said, the problem is we can talk about this on the podcast, but then there will emerge some footage of me sitting in the F-Type at 60 miles an hour for 30 miles on the M1. I- I've definitely been at fault. I try as hard as I can. Like I-, I like to think that I'm not a lane hogger. And if I ever see anyone even approaching my rear mirrors, illegally speeding or not, I'm like, I get right out of the way. I try yeah. to be as good as possible. But there'll definitely be times when I haven't been paying attention and I've ended up sitting in that lane longer than I could have been. Yeah. I will freely put, put my hands up and admit that. But I see it far worse than what I'm doing, one million percent, and I get aggravated by it. So therefore, I hope, to, I like to think that I'm not the worst offender. I mean, we are, we have got, we're very lucky in this country because we've got one of the safest road networks in the world and the motorways as well. They are, statistically, the safest roads in the world. Just bumpy. That, yeah, but they are very safe. Um, but the the, 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 the the driving standards, are, some of them, mate, and you know what? There's even cars. There's even actual cars that are actually worse defenders than other car makers. So the worst that I always see is Peugeot. If you've got a Peugeot, by the way, just don't drive. Get the bus. Like, li- throw the car away. Get the train or the bus or fly. Do anything. Just don't get in your car. They're the worst drivers ever. The other ones, hybrid, Toyota, Uber drivers. Oh, yes. No, but Uber drivers in general. Uber drivers in general are just so far up their own bums. Do you think they rule the road? They do whatever they like. And don't get me started on Uber drivers in central London. I actually think Range Rovers. Not I was, That was my third one. Yeah, but often old Range Rovers. Yeah. But do you know what that is? The Range Rover is for completely the different reason of the, the, the Uber driver and the Peugeot driver. Yeah. The Range Rover is, I'm in a Range Rover... I'm in a great big Jeep and I am not moving. Well, I'm so blocking the road. I can I can tell you what my my dad used to obviously have all those Range Rover Sports. Wasn't that at all because he's not that mentality, but his was, I hate driving. <laughs> I'm miserable. <laughs> I've bought this very expensive car that I don't know if I even like, but it's very comfortable. Yeah. And if I just join the motorway and just get on the f- into that fast lane, I don't have to do anything for 70 miles. You just drive it. I can just sit here. Yeah, I'll put adaptive cruise control on. Radio 4, I don't have to pay attention. Yeah, and I've got to be here, but... Yeah, I've got to be here. Yeah. There's nothing I can do about it, but I'm not going to move lanes. <laughs> oh, that's exhausting. I think that's Range Rovers. Yeah. But, you know, what can we do? We can sit here and moan and complain. We're not going to change anything. Well... This is, this is just... I see people complain about Twitter all the time. Yeah. You know, we're lucky we get to go into mainland Europe and see how people really use their their motorway network or their yeah. auto route network, and it makes sense. Overtaking then get out of the way and I'll say, I try my best, but... Sometimes you just get caught in that train. That's the other thing which is hard, is let's say you get caught in that train of people going 60, 62 miles an hour, but you've then also got traffic in the middle lane. What are you supposed to do? Like aggressively cut in between nonstop? Because you then up, um, uh, end up undertaking, which is also not permitted. Yeah. So it's a, anyway, it, it's the mess. It's a mess, but yeah. rant over. I know, um, there's one more little bit. Oh. One more, sorry. There's another thing that really Please. annoys me, annoys me ju- just as much as that lorries overtaking other lorries yeah. on two carriageways so one's doing 55 and one's doing 56 now i understand i'm probably going to upset some lorry drivers because i'm sure some of you are but honestly what does one mile and actually it's dangerous by the way because if it's a if there's a, an emergency vehicle trying to get past on a two one lorry's doing 55 and one lorry's doing 56 you're holding a queue of traffic up there's nothing you can do about it. You've got to sit there. You, you either break or come back in, which you obviously don't want to do, or you sit there and wait till you overtook, which takes 25 minutes because you're doing one mile an hour faster than the truck in front. Tony. Which is which it, it's Tony, infuriating. If you were a lorry driver, would you not be launching every other lorry on the road? No. Yes, shut up. You, I'm sorry, would be there maxing out RPMs and speed on your lorry, 
Get out of the way. I'm coming through. Well, I wouldn't do it. It's just, yeah, no. It annoys me so no, much. No, you are caught in a lie there, my friend. <laughs> you would be launching everyone. I I am not going to tackle lorry drivers like you on that one. Oh, that okay. one, I will just, you know, that's what it is. So one story which we haven't shared yet, which um, didn't make it into the edit because I know it won't. Um, it was we, way too fast. <laughs> we went up the... <laughs> Gross Glockner in uh, Austria, beautiful. One of the best driving roads in Europe. If you got there early in the morning, you're the only people there. So we're having some fun. And uh, we're going right up to the top and we're, we're, we're doing some speed. And I remembered, oh, yeah, there's a tunnel at some point. So when I went in the F-type, I left a camera by the side of the road and did like a big flyby through this tunnel. And I see the tunnel at the top. And I'm like, yeah, here we go. I'm going to give it large. So building up some speed. So we get to the tunnel. I just send it into the tunnel like, Meh! There's two tunnels. Um... <laughs> The first one has a really hard right as soon as you go into it. And it was about six degrees and it was wet and there was ice. And I literally, as I went, I went, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so the wrong tunnel. So I'm like, right, I can't touch the brakes because I'm dead. I genuinely thought this is a huge smash. I was, like, I was like, oh, no. And I'm looking, I'm half knowing that Tony's like right behind me. So somehow I make it round to the right and then I go, oh, no, but then it's hard right out of the tunnel as well. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I've got to somehow shift gear. But obviously, being in a manual, one car, um, you can see on the footage, which will not be shared anywhere. <laughs> um, I literally, I go ash and white. I somehow get the car around, and I'm like, ah! I'm going for a gear, swing it into the next right, and somehow we made it alive. It's the worst feeling when you're going ploughing into a tunnel, and there's awful. water, because it's always slippery in a tunnel as well. And then you think, oh, oh. There's a right there. I mean, it was a disaster. And you yeah. should never go ploughing into a tunnel. I just convinced myself yes, it was straight. No, you should never go. <laughs> but the yes. best thing is, and he is a listener. There was a, a lad in a GT3 RS who had followed us up the hill a bit. Co coincidentally, he was there in his car and he'd followed us. And I think the view from his car must have been outrageous because he'd already been up and down a few times. So he would have remembered that the tunnel went right. And we would have just gone, boop, into this yeah, black. That? We didn't see him again. He was like, I'm no. not following these idiots. Yeah. Um, Do you remember that time I nearly put the pistol in the wall in yeah, Spain? Yeah, yeah. Gary was sitting next to me, wouldn't he, Gal? No. But then he was sitting next to me. Yeah. The biggest crash I've ever seen. We've all been in the car with him. <laughs> it goes, quite terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, not fun. It's because he's so competitive. He's oh, just yeah. determined to be like, oh, fucking have everyone. Yeah. Um, so, but we had fun on our, on our trip. We had a good time. We did, yeah. Apart from that one moment, we drove fairly sensibly. Um, I think by now, all the main channel videos will be out. So if you want to see any of our adventures on track or off track, you can go and check them out. Um, but as I say, uh, it wouldn't have included You should check out the on track one because it's like we nearly had a crash like genuinely had a big crash did you keep the that problem in? is with you Tony <laughs> oh, it's this competitiveness but so did you keep it in I don't know I haven't edited that video oh. yet but I probably I almost in. certainly will I almost yeah. certainly will because it was funny Tony even I think even if you were on track with Lewis Hamilton I think it, you would I wouldn't see where he'd gone no no I think you would probably at least well, firstly, you send it up my inside once. So, so we're going up Austria, turn one. This was the, this was the worst part. The funniest Prick! <laughs> um, I go, right, come on. So all jokes aside, we said this in the main channel video, he is genuinely very quick, Tony. On track and, and off track. Tony is a very good driver and very, very quick. And a lot of it is confidence, but a huge amount of it is skill. So Not uh, a lot of skill. Uh, uh, no, 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 don't do yourself a disservice. He knows what he's doing. Big so, crash. We spent half the morning doing our own thing, and I said, right, let's go out on track at the same time. You can kind of see what my lines are doing, and it'll be good for the video. So we're going up towards turn one, which is straight uphill. You can break really late, and we Does both Does anyone know Red Bull Ring? Does it know? Hands Does up if you know go? the Red Bull Ring, the F1 track. It goes uphill, okay, yeah. So it's a right. really steep uphill, and it's a fast right-hander at the start of the lap. And we'd worked out early in the morning that kind of normal braking was at the 150 meter board and throughout the day you're going to get as close to that. Did you go past the 100 meter board at any point? I did when I overtook you. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> I had to. So we're going and he's coming up the inside and I go, this bloody bell end, he's just going <laughs> to, he's going to send it, he's too competitive. So I go, I'll do the old switcheroo on him and I'm going to break just after the 150 because he thinks I'm going to break at 200. I'll break just after the 150. He's going to be too competitive. He'll try and send it up the inside. So he does. I break. He goes sailing up the inside. I go, great, I'm going to do the switcheroo. Instead of allowing me to cut under him and power up the next straight, he literally parks on the apex. He comes to a stop <laughs> on the apex. So I'm like, here we go. Ah! <laughs> I have to grind to hold, lock up, and then he goes, <laughs> and drives <laughs> off up the hill. The thing, the thing that done me was, right, if it, had been, if it had been roles reversed and I'd have been on the inside and you'd have been on the outside, Breaking at 150 is late. Mm -hmm. 
I broke at the hundred, mate. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. couldn't stop the car. That but mate, the problem, we like, were not in a race. No, there is a huge runoff. It's a track. There's like the bit. It's F1 grade. You could have just gone straight. I and nearly you did. Keep saying, mate. I had to make the corner. No, you didn't. But I'm not you going off. Why not? Because it's I don't tarmac go off. runoff. It's, there's no gravel, there's no, you could have just gone straight instead, much more dangerously, at 100 odd miles an hour, you went, I'll just stop here. Yeah, because I want to get the car turned. But anyway, that's another thing. And there was another one. When this you got the inside of it. No, oh, funny, no, sorry, going one. downhill. That was the worst one, I had to get out of it. So there's another thing, it's like turn three. So you, you go up the hill, turn right, then there's another, another far straight, then you turn right again. And then there's another straight, and it's downhill braking, and it's like a tight, second gear but set it up because this was later in the day yeah i had gained, he was fast I, i'd gained some yeah, speed i gained some then. speed but there's one corner which is the downhill right where hamilton punted off uh, albon a few years ago yeah, and you know it's good. the famous everyone called uh, i just couldn't quite get it right i couldn't carry as much speed as tony and, and i was still learning how to do that corner <laughs> so tony's this far from my bumper everywhere we go i'm just like piss off and so there's a great shot and you can see him right behind my bumper and I go into the corner and I'm going, oh no, I'm still a bit too far. So I carry the brakes into the corner. He, this far from my bumper goes, oh, I'm about to punt him off the track. So I have to swerve out of the way. If we can slam on the brakes uh, again. Mate, I had to, no, I didn't slam on the, I had to get out the brakes. Okay. I, I mean, I was literally going to pile into the back here. I, mean, I had thanks, to get mate. out of the brakes I would have pay, You would have had to pay for my car, you know that. Yeah. Yeah. What a dick. So don't go on track with Tony. Don't uh, go on track with yeah, yeah, or at least let him go half a lap before you. But we had a good time. Tony, impressions of Australia, go. Uh, yeah. Shit hole. Uh. <laughs> Full on. I mean, this, I'm in here doing a podcast trying to look after you all, and there's fucking something trying to eat me. <laughs> <laughs> Could you, what would be your favourite city so far? We still have Perth left, but out London. of Melbourne. London, okay. <laughs> out of Melbourne. Gold, oh, here. No, Gold Coast. Sydney. No. Sydney, yeah. So far, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? You guys get a bad rep outside of Sydney, you know? And actually, some of you even today are like, Sydney's a shithole because um, you live outside of it. But for us, I think it's the closest we get to a big international city vibe. And that's not to slag off any other parts, but Gold Coast, obviously, is just retired people going to sleep. Um, <laughs> Melbourne has its own vibe, but it's a little bit too edgy. It's a bit of a Shoreditch kind of city, if that means it's, it's a bit too edgy. Whereas Sydney is just like, it feels like big city yeah. European international vibes, which we. This feels with. the closest to London, essentially. Yeah, this, I guess. City, which, for sure. I can understand why that's not always attractive, but, but we've liked that. And then, yeah, Tony hasn't experienced Perth yet, so <laughs> that's going to be fun. <laughs> Would you work in a bank? <laughs> Tony, bug, huge bug. Is that going to kill us? What? Who said yes? Yeah. Twice. <laughs> Why are you all laughing? It's not funny. <laughs> Fucking hell. I'm freaking out now, guys. If that, if, will that jump? Yeah. Everyone's giving me mixed answers and it stuck me out. <laughs> what is it? Why is he running away? DJ, don't move away. You've got to stay close and stamp on it if it comes at me. Okay, right. I'm now not going to be paying attention to anything else apart from this psycho. Shoo shoo. Shoo shoo. Are you admitting that you're starting to see some of these older cars, whilst they might be crap and expensive to run, do have something about them? No. Oh. <laughs> if I could get that bug to bite me and kill me now, I would. Tony's dog is the size of Tony. It would, I mean, I'd be terrified. It'd be quite funny to have him in the podcast wanting to sit in there, staring, sort of, you know, death staring people. But he would, yeah, that's yeah. what he'd do. He'd yeah, just sit there looking at you all. Thinking, <laughs> Judging you. Thinking, I mean, that'd be dead. <laughs> The bug would be gone in a It'd second. It'd be dead, mate. Yeah, gone. Absolutely. I'm fuming about this. Bug's come over me now. <laughs> that bug is destined to kill us. Uh, they couldn't get, mate. It's just literally that's Mate, I'm genuinely a... like close now. I know. Sketching me out too. <laughs> what even is it, mate? It's huge. I think I saw fangs on it earlier. <laughs> it's called a cockroach? That's not a cockroach, is it? I think it's a snake. What is it? <laughs> but what is it, though? No one knows, mate. Anyway, 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 can we get distracted? Come on. Sorry, there's a question at the back, please. This bug just loves us, mate. Oh, the bug's right under you, mate. The bug is right under you. That mate, go on, go on, kill it. The size of that thing. It's quite friendly to be fair. It's got, like, fur and everything. We really need to stop. Pick it up. We, we should pick it up. We need to stop looking at the bug. Is it worth a few quid, that yeah, car? It is, over a million dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be a big crash. It will be. Yeah. 
<laughs> Very cool, though. And you're right, often overlooked as a bit of Australian Australian uh, flag waver. Yeah, so See, you're flapping I was now, say, Can we just notice, everyone, by the way, the bug has made its way to the front of the audience. They are freaking out, people. <laughs> they are freak. Oh, he's brave. Oh, this well is a bushman. Steve Irwin's got it. Steve <laughs> Irwin's got it. Oh! <laughs> oh! Not near the RS, please. Um, so, yeah, ha have you ever... Tony's picked it up with his hands. Flipping hell. He's a pig farmer. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to have that for dinner. Tony's... <laughs> hey, guys. Um, since you're in the country full of uh, dangerous creatures, what's the most dangerous car that each of you have driven? Oh, easy. I mean, that's quite easy. Go on, what's yours? Pista. A Pista, yeah, 480 Pista. With uh, cold tyres. Yeah, you, yeah, often say that. I think it is a bit larry. I, I'd say F12 TDF. Yeah, F12, I think they're similar, yeah. Very similar. TDF yeah. just wants, literally wants to kill you in laughs when it does it. Yeah. Pista, I think, is more like, but, yeah. um, yeah. It's more like Karate Kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah literally. It's just like, yeah. you know, it's just all in a split second, like something that happens so fast. What was the punch, what's it called, the Bruce Lee, like, like you just don't see the Pista coming, and then it's like, dead. Yeah. Where the TDF is like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, yeah. So, yeah. They're both death traps. What, what about dangerous in terms of shit boxes? Oh, 360 Ferrari. <laughs> Oh, I'm proud the, of the worst thing is when you all laugh, he loves it. He dines out on it. He thinks, right, I saw that. That one goes down well. I'll do that a few more times. Yeah. These repeats it everywhere we go. You've got to stop encouraging it. Uh, okay, so we got the we got the A5. Yep. Obviously, your bro's just ruining your life with R rates every day of the uh, week. Yep, yep. When would you say the first... It doesn't have to be supercar, but when did you feel like this proper first sports or yep. or supercar came along? So after after the A5, I, I, I stayed with Audi for ages. I think I owned like back to back like six different TTs. I kept buying just different <laughs> variations of TTs. It's it was basically an R8. But, yeah, exactly. <laughs> In my head, I was like, it's like a baby R8. <laughs> but my first ever like, I would say proper car, um, <clears throat> funnily enough, Tony ended up buying from me, to be fair, was my, I had a, so how old have I been? It was 20... 16, so I think I was 23. No, I was 22. Um, I had an AMG GTS, okay. and that was like my first proper car, like in terms of, you know, like a super, like sort of super sports car. And you car. can fit in them as well. They've got a lot of room as yeah. well, them AMG cars, yeah. And I will say this now, going from a Quattro 2-litre TT that you feel like Superman in to buying a rear-wheel drive AMG GTS, I think that you're going to be absolutely fine. As a 22-year-old as well, you know, you, you try and sharp a little bit. You learn some lessons in that pretty <laughs> sharpish. I'll tell you that for nothing. You learn some lessons pretty quick. It's a Larry, Larry car. Very yeah. Larry. <laughs> it, so you know, it was when Paul had, do you remember Paul had his blood red one? Oh yeah. my God, we yeah. ruined it. That, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He had the blood red one. Um, and that me, he said, so I remember the day he got his wrapped in that red, I just got mine like de-chromed and stuff down at Dove Customs and we went and picked them up together okay. because I was, um, the, the car before that, I had a, uh, again, another TT uh, and I got it wrapped there and coincidentally, I turned up one day at Dove Customs and Paul was there. Oh. I was like, oh, and that's how I met Paul and it was just really random okay. and then um, he heard about my GT, I heard about his through Dub and then we went and picked them up together and we shot a little video. It was really cool, man. Do you remember... Was it before or after the red when he when he had that like dark chrome that he had to wax with like Mate, whales oil? Sat, or something satin like? black chrome he had. <laughs> satin black chrome. And I, don't get me wrong, it was cool, but I was like, for the work you're putting into this, bro, yes. wrap it Matt Gray and be done with it. Because this is insane. The stuff that he used to have to explain to me is like, oh you have to get like sixteen tubs of Vaseline and I have to like <laughs> rub it four times a day. And I was like, what? And it's just black. Like yeah, you just got a literally, black car. It wasn't it, it yeah, it didn't do him any favours, man. That was a headache, that thing. But quite a change as well from Audi to Merc, not yes. just to a powerful wheel drive sports car. Yeah. How did you bond with the whole Merc thing? Because it's like super different interface. and Yeah, it was quite different, actually. Like you said, that, that was a weird thing. I think at the time, when you're that young, you hear like a... You know, like I used to do this all the time when I was younger, right? I would see someone's car and go, yeah, what litre is it? Like, that was the most important <laughs> thing in What's the world. The MPG? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice, nice. Um, so for me, it was kind of, again, referring back to Tony's famous, if it's not a 999 deposit, a 999 <laughs> car, but buying it. 
Merck <laughs> used to have these crazy deals. They you know, all have, though, at some point. They, though, right? At some point, they use And now, obviously, the whole the whole market's changed. It's not like this anymore. Uh, and you used to not be able to discuss it, but now it doesn't really matter because it was about eight years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, for that car, I put three grand down, and I think I paid 600 quid a month yeah. for oh a brand new God. AMG GTS. Yeah. That's why I bought it. Yeah, fair. I'll come clean, because everybody looked at me like, Jeweled, what are you doing, <laughs> mate? How you pulled this one off? It's like 100 odd grand's worth of car here. I was like, mate, I'm paying 84 money for this. Oh. It's insane. Yeah, like, I was paying yeah. 600 quid a month. Don't get me wrong, 600 quid is not a small amount of money, for, but for a GTS, yeah. for that kind of car. Do you know car. what I mean? It was crazy. We are now an hour into your first ever press day. Yeah. What were your thoughts? Well, I was asleep. <laughs> 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 do, you want, do you want to explain to people what we've experienced so far? Well, yeah, so we, we, we arrived to this beautiful manor house, lovely place in the middle of Birmingham. Yeah, we're, we're Solihull, Solihull, which is just outside Birmingham, in the, in the middle of the UK, Mid- we could say. Yeah, I would say that. We were greeted by uh, uh, some, some croissants and some breakfast. Some lovely people at the desk said good morning. We had a nice coffee. We had a little sit down. We met some people. Journalists. I don't think they're um, video journalists. No, but a lot they of are journalists. Regional written journalists. Yeah. So from you know from Birmingham Daily and some of that. But there's a few recognisable people that I know or recognise. Yeah. I have no yeah. idea who they are at all. <laughs> He's like, so are these YouTubers? I was like, <laughs> yeah, nope. like, what, are these, what are these people do? <laughs> and then um, we we got comfortable and um, started to watch a video. <laughs> and then and then half hour later I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something which is very, very normal. Is that normal? For, especially an Italian brand. But right. most press events is there'll be a briefing. So before you go out in the cars, they do a briefing so that you're familiar with the product you're about to drive and you understand about the sort of brand's ethos and trying to answer all the questions that journalists are probably going to ask the press team throughout the day. They just want to get it out, out of the way early on. And but, actually, probably not a bad idea because, because you watch a video they haven't got to stand there forgetting things it's all pre-recorded there's a number of people that make the video so they try and make it a little bit more engaging because you're not listening to the same person for half an hour so i I get why they do it because don't forget that this isn't the only thing they're going to do throughout the course of the year they do this hundreds of times a year, right? And this is a a, a press tour. So right. so there are a number of stops on this tour. So it's just easy for them to just have a pre-recorded video. Yeah. And Ferrari are very good at it. <laughs> they do about three hour long ones. Do they? The problem is the videos I find are great for like the first 15 minutes. I'm absorbing all the information. <laughs> I drink the Kool-Aid. I'm like, yes, Maserati is a luxury brand. Uh, yeah. Yes, the styling is fan. Oh, and the exciting future is exciting. Yeah. And then by about minute 20, I'm starting to go... I'm not sure I care about the, <laughs> the spec choices. Of the, I just want to drive the car. It just, it somehow goes on a tad too long, but we cannot blame them for that. They're, no. they're trying to provide us with all the different information and we're just the, well, what would you call it? Spoiled buggers who are like, just get us in the car. Yeah. That's how we're going to find out about these things. Yeah. Okay, so go down here. I have no idea what we're going to find. That's right. Yep, yep. Just, all right. I'm hoping you can have some fun. What have you, have you just... I've made this up. I mean, it's a big truck coming, so that's not a good start, but no. just keep that in mind if you start going fast. I'm there could be a truck coming the other way. Where does one go to here? I see trucks. I mean, where have you taken me, mate? Engine sounds very different to some of the other vehicles we've driven today, which has the same engine. Yeah. Loads more turbo whistle, a bit gruntier, less kind of tinny. And even, even from outside, oh, it's fast as car. Yeah. This car is, from memory, really fast when you really get into that throttle pedal. Uh, It's actually not that fast. Oh, really? No, it's fast, but it's not like, oh my God, fucking... Uh, I think you have to really get into the throttle, from, from my memory. I could be wrong, but like... I had the same thing that I would, like... I mean, don't kill us, but you know what I mean? No, 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 I'm going slowly, mate. <laughs> You're not going that slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I want a 60 mile an hour road. Yeah, yeah, fair. But we'll get, get, get past this and hopefully it's going to open up to a bit of a national speed limit road. But yeah, okay, well, you see, you're comparing it to what? Well, a, t- a turbocharged Ferrari. Or, a, a. Or, or, a, or a McLaren. My, my, my direct rival to this I would think 
it's not a Turbo S, is it? Cause it's a proper supercar. This. Yeah. It's um, it's like a McLaren, um, not 720S. It's like a 570S, right? Yeah, 570S. It's not really a comparable car at the moment. But I mean, Artura, obviously, this is a hybrid. So yeah, you're then saying 570S, maybe the McLaren GT, for example. Um, it's of that ilk, or yeah, 48A, F8. It's sort of hard to know exactly where to position it, but... I'm not, I'm not sure it's F8, 4A8. I, I think it's... I don't think it's as good as them. Mm. I don't think it's... Um, is it carbon tub, this car? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah. But you know why it's probably... I, I wouldn't say it's, it, it's a Ferrari rival because of the engine, because you can't compare this to 296, obviously. Um, so then you'd compare it to, to the V8 Ferraris, and it's, that's not fair. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a bit down on, on power. I really hope the uh, audio is coming across. It's co <laughs> Both of us <laughs> concentrating quite hard. <laughs> it's not usually that I don't speak, but uh, I was just letting you all enjoy just the let me enjoy sound of the engine <laughs> exhaust. Oh, good God. Did you breathe at that point? <laughs> nope. Uh, I thought I'd just, you know, hold my breath. And... I mean, it just goes down the road quite nicely, mate, to be fair. It's a little bit crashy still, though. Yes, yeah, so yeah. it, it moves. But I like a car that moves around. Sure. Uh, oh, yeah, a car that wants to kill you is the best car in the world, yeah. right? But I wouldn't buy one. No. It's not. It, it, it's not for me. I'm actually glad that I've been actually managed to because I have looked at these before. Sure. So I'm actually glad that I've, I've come out and drove it today. So I appreciate that. No, it's, hey, uh, well, I'm here to help. Your I car, have, your car <laughs> buying decisions. <laughs> I've spent 200 on grand and went, oh, oh, oh no, oh, Ford, oh, I'm in the RS6. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that spec nearly was 200 grand as well, but anyway. I'm saying this in a celebratory way, but also with a few tears in my eye. The 360 sold. <laughs> no, it's sold. <laughs> I mean, the whole car community know it's sold. Bloody hell. I mean, actually, ladies and gentlemen, you crashed the Collecting Cars website last night. Yeah. As the auction for my Ferrari 360 ended, so many people logged on to witness the end of the auction that you crashed the site. So, Tony, you're probably not wrong to say that a lot of the car community are aware that it's sold. Wait, they are. Um, but yeah, my God, I'm not going to name the buyer. He wants to remain anonymous, but he is actually a listener of this podcast. Paid top dollar for my car. What an absolute hero. An absolute congratulations to him. And actually, I, I have mobbed that car, mate, and <laughs> gone in on it several times. And actually nearly died in it once. <laughs> <laughs> but he has bought a really lovely example of a... 360 Moderna. Oh, and cool. that's partly credit to you because you maintained it. Is it prestigiously? Prestigiously. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You actually got me a little bit emotional then. No. <laughs> I was like, Tony, you're saying okay. nice things about the 360. I'm like, I'm getting really teary-eyed, but... Yeah, it's yeah. still a pile of shit, but <laughs> it's a nice Somebody one. Somebody else's pile of shit, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just to recap, in case you missed last week's episode, which I don't think, uh, well, you regular listeners would have, because it was very... Uh, well, we got great listener numbers last week, Tony. Oh, yeah. Um, the car went up, at collecting cars. Uh, sort of auction started slow-ish. Uh, kind of got up to, like, the mid 40s uh by midweek and then it kind of stalled out and then at some point i think it was thursday wednesday or thursday i got a text from the collecting cars team saying big bid has just come in go check it out so i opened the page and i was like 70 grand i was mm -hmm. like hello like i knew it was worth that wasn't sure anyone else would think so <laughs> yeah. and they uh they were like we're just checking it out because uh, it had jumped from i think 47 and a half then a bid came in from 65 and then that same bidder then bid up, bid himself up. Bid himself up, To yeah. 70K. And they were you like, that's a, little, that's a little unusual. So we're just going to check it out. And also it's a big leap. Like, stay, bear with us. And I was like, oh, please don't be a hoax. Because like, I'm really excited now. Please don't be Tony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if it was me? <laughs> on, are you idiot? No one's paying this much. Um, but no, they'd said, look, it all seems legit. And actually the guy then DM'd me on, on Instagram a few days later. And like, you know, I was just like, look, I, I keep my fingers crossed for you. But he was like, look, just so you know, it was just fully intentional. Essentially, his tactic, as far as I understood it, was 
I really want the car, and I kind of just want to end things early. Like, I want to bid it sort of strongly enough that everyone else is going to go, I'm out, fine, like, let's just watch it go, like, good on that guy. Mm -hmm. So I think his initial bid was the 65K, and then he kind of got a bit nervous and thought, ooh, maybe that's not going to be enough to really, like, warn people off or ward people off, so I'll go 70. And good on him, because I actually got two emails post that from people saying that their max bids were going to be 60, well, one was 64 and one was 65K. Um, so so if he, he wouldn't have bought it. Well, if he left it at 65, it could have got a bit juicy at the end, but he made the right tactic for him. And he wanted the car because apparently he's watched a lot of the adventures. He's listened to the podcast. He felt attached to the car, understood it's maybe... Well, he had more... He got the sentimental value for him. The sentimental right. value for him. So... I think, let's be honest, he has paid top dollar. I paid top dollar for that car six years ago. He's paid top dollar, but he's very happy to have done so. Yeah. And I'm ecstatic that he's done so. And I'm glad he feels like some sort of attachment to it because I've been in it and never felt attached to it. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was going to fall apart. Hey, no. don't say that. <laughs> no. Don't say that. No, honestly, it is a... It, like I just said, it's a it's a it's a really really lovely example, and I'm I'm pleased. It's obviously gone to a good home. Yeah. All jokes aside, for me, it was literally the best scenario because I know that car is going to be cherished and loved and continued to be driven the way that I've driven it. It's yeah. going to be taken on adventures. Uh, the owner's got plans to oh, take it to different places. Yeah. Oh, totally going to oh, use lovely. it. Also means that I can stay in touch with them in case I. Regret the decision. I want to buy it back. I'm obviously going to have to pay even top top dollar at that point. <laughs> uh, he's really got me over the barrel at that he's stage. Done you he? In. Yeah, he's, he maybe that's his tactic. Maybe he knew Sam's going to regret this and want it back at some point. So I'll make sure he has to pay loads. Uh, Do you remember when Tony said he was as good as Lionel Messi? Uh, <laughs> he didn't say that. <laughs> he did. Say that. His arg hard. his argument was him and me would easily ha be able to have a kickabout with Lionel Messi, whereas we wouldn't be able to jump into an F1 race and have a drive around with Lewis Hamilton. Yeah, we would. The point being... Only if he weren't driving. Only <laughs> if he weren't moving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could all get into cars and just go around a circuit with Lewis Hamilton. You could go to a football pitch and kick around with Lionel Messi. You too could not last five minutes in any kind of competitive nature in a Premier League football match with not just Messi, I'm talking about Bromley, who's I, a really crap Premier League I reckon League I team. could if I was in goal. You Brom had not got Brom hope in hell. Bromley? <laughs> I don't know, who's a bad, who's a bad <laughs> Premier League team? I'm just about Bromley. Bromley, they're non-league A hundred percent he was thinking right. of Burnley, who still aren't in the Premier League. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. I was thinking of Bromley. Um, but <laughs> you're, you're super unrealistic with this claim. That you think just because you play football, you have a really good understanding of what Messi does. And it's similar. He plays football. You play football. It's the same. I, never I, said dr that. I drive. Hamilton drives. It's the same. I never you said, said that. you can understand because the mechanics are similar. You can imagine or you can understand or it's easier for you to interpret or, or analyze. You was going in on him. I was because I hate Messi. He's a load of hype. No, 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 no. Never to live <laughs> <in> <laughs> of hype. No, you, you was going in on Lewis Hamilton saying that he should just retire and that's it. He's no good anymore. And I, and I pulled you up and said that you, you, you as a human being, because you've never experienced what he's experienced in the F1 car, none of us have. Uh, well, 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 you, you, well you as, as, as you David can't. from Brisbane, one of our live viewers, just reminded him, I can, because I've actually driven an F1 car, Tony. But, but, but not under the pressures that, that they have, just like me and Paul played football all our lives, but not under the pressures that Messi has, and that's the difference between him being... A, a top professional and us just being layman's. Yeah, yeah. But so, what I'm saying is the grasp of football is loads easier to grasp than you can almost feel the sensation in football, right? Everyone's kicked a ball. Every Mate, everyone's driven a car. No, no, yes. nah, no. But they, the, <laughs> yeah. But an F1 <laughs> car, it's not, it's not comparable to any car you're ever going to drive. Have you driven one? No. Well, I have. Let me tell you <laughs> how you, it is you, comparable. Let, let, me, one, let me tell you how it is comparable. Let me tell you how it is comparable. Acceleration. It's embarrassing Accel that you're even <laughs> saying <laughs> Acceleration. <laughs> I've given an F1 listen, listen, listen to it. <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> listen to it. Acceleration. You've accelerated in a Bugatti Veyron and a 918 Spider, am I correct? Yeah. Take that, times it by 1.52. The, the, the sensation is similar. It's just continued and more aggressive. You will not accelerate flat out in a Formula One car and go, this is not like anything I've ever experienced before. My brain cannot comprehend it. Right. It's acceleration. Okay, so that's the first point. Correct. Second point. That's not the big point though. Se down the straight line. Se second point. <laughs> braking. Right. Very, 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 very hard to understand. 
just how capable the brakes are, especially about temperature and things like that. But braking is a force and something that you have experienced if you've driven any kind of race car. I'm not talking about road cars. You have to have driven a race car to have unassisted braking feel, pedal feel, etc. But I know you have driven a Slicks and Wings car, right? Yeah, but... So hold on a second. So, so braking. So it's, it's that... It's, it's a race car braking times X and Z. Aerodynamics. The hardest part to understand and the hardest part to experience, which I definitely did not experience, because mechanical grip of a Formula One car is so high. Exactly. So go back to Paul's TTRS, where he said I couldn't get the thing to step out. The initial mechanical grip from a Formula One car is of that level that someone like me, who's driving around 40 seconds off the lap time of a, of a F1 driver. 40. Easily, well, a minute and a half, whatever you Easy. want to say. <laughs> it was actually 42 seconds, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, One lap forty to seven. That's embarrassing. I wouldn't admit to that. We we won't say that as well. That the track was half half a minute shorter. Um, but I mean, it is good. it's I was, all unraveling for you. I was all in the mechanical. Grip. I wouldn't be so, telling anyone I drive no, an F one car. No, me too. Aero, uh, aero. I agree is the hardest thing to understand what it's like to drive a car on the edge, relying on aerodynamic grip because you're trusting on you know, the, the air and dynamics pushing the car into the ground, which we don't experience in the world. I don't care who you are. Going, well, my GT4's got a wing, so I know all about aero. You have no freaking clue. No chance. <laughs> but, but, that is something which you could comprehend or understand. It's the only part, cornering speed is the only thing that any racing driver says is the mind-boggling thing about four cars is the speed that they can go through corners. And you would never but get that. I, I, me personally, no, but that's a confidence thing. Right. And if you Even spend, if, confident. if you spent three days in slicks and wings cars, building up to the F1 car, you would because, no for, exa for example, on the day that I drove the car, they put us out in F4 cars to begin with, right? That have very, very minimal downforce and are at much lower speeds. And on the start of the day, you're going through the fast right hander, which they do on the actual Grand Prix. So I can't, I don't know what number it is. And you start off, and you're like shifting down gears, you're braking. By the end of the session, you've realised that it's completely flat. Now you get into the F1 car, the speeds are way higher, but the mechanical and aerodynamic grip are also way higher. So at that point, you are told and you are led to believe that corner is flat. And your understanding from the F4 car lets you go, right, if I'm flat in the F4 car, I can be flat in the F1 car because everything is times X amount. So, okay, average punter walking down the street in his Fiat Panda can he understand what it's like to drive a Formula One car? I don't think so. But the three of us... No. The three of us who have driven a huge range of cars on and off track... Paul has also driven some variety of single-seater that claimed to be an F1 car. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tony, you've driven cars with slicks and wings. You understand aerodynamics and mechanical grip. It is that times an, uh, 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 what's, uh, with a multiple. I, I completely understand that we would never get to that multiple. We'd never get to that point because we're not good enough. Yeah, that, you would. No, we you wouldn't. would. You would never, ever. So what you're trying to say is with some practice, within a few seconds, you could get to the same lap time as Lewis. Of course, oh. it's the same lap time. But that's what you're I saying. You can, go around, you, can go, you can go around the corner. You you could go around the corner. So basically, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a scenario, right? Cops mm -hmm. at um, Silverstone. Mm-hmm. It's flat in an F1 car, 200 mile an hour. And the only reason why they can't go around there faster is because of the friction of the tyre when you turn the wheel, mm -hmm. right? In, a, in a, 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 an F4 car, for instance, you probably do that at 100. And even then you're thinking, flipping hell, this is fast, right? In a, in a, in a really good, uh, how else would I explain it? In a, in a Senna which is just about as good as a road car, you'd probably go around their similar speeds. You're going around their double the speed, completely flat, and you do that for 50-odd laps consistently. It, it, we, we would never, ever get to that level. Um, that What I'm trying to say, the, the football comparison is, is that, yeah, M Messi's talent is far greater than, in my opinion, than anyone who ever kicked a ball. The sensation is the same. We've all kicked the ball into a net. The sensation is the same. Yeah, he can kick it harder and he's loads more skillful. We would never, ever get that sensation in an F1 car because we never got the talent. I, I think that's a completely fair statement. But the reason that I'm going to challenge you is your, your 
belief that you understand Messi better than Hamilton because what you have never done is taken a penalty at a World Cup for your nation's side in a semi-final or final and you've also never gone up against and I won't be able to but, and you've never gone up against and you don't know what it would be like to play against 11 Premier League I won't be able to. or professional I football get players the ball. but you also but you can't comprehend it no. you might have played a really great five-a-side team from Bromley oi oi um, <laughs> and thought wow they're good like that was a lot but you, as an average punter who's kicked a ball, it's not just the mechanics of kicking the ball. I agree that the speed would blow your mind. And I don't think even in a day you could get within five seconds of a Formula One lap that time. Would be, that would be the football equivalent as well, by the way. I would never, and not many people do, can think how many millions and millions of people play football across the world. There's only really a select number of people that... that that play Premier League football, real high level football, because of the fault and speed. You would never ever get up to speed if you thought you was good. And and me and Paul played at a half decent level and we we you know we played with people that played at a higher level than us. And you can see the level difference. Mm. It's like when you go when you look at like touring car drivers or or GT3 drivers, they're still unbelievable. But if if you have one of them sitting here now like you take like like Ollie or or Max Chilton, um, very unbelievable drivers, but there's just another level, and they to a certain degree would be able to tell us and understand Max especially because he he's driven an F1 car flat out, he, you know, but but you 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 cannot comprehend the what they go through their bodies, the skill level of doing that, not just one lap, all the while. Whereas a football match, yeah, I get what you're saying about it being, uh, you know, the, the the fault and the speed. And the physicality. And the physicality. It's everything because it's top level sport. It's the same. Paul played tennis at a really high level and he was good. But we've had loads of chats about it before. Like, And I said to him, well, what if you played someone decent, professional? And he said, like, he, he wouldn't even get near the women pros and that's a you know I'm saying I'm not saying that's derogatory to all <laughs> yeah. no 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 but oh, I, I knew that. there was a mistake going live each week <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying that derogatory what oh, I'm no, saying I know what you're trying to say is this physicality, yeah, it's yeah, physicality. Yeah, yeah. and the level yeah yeah of course so yeah. I could hit the ball as hard as the women professional tennis players but it's it's the consistency and their ball placement and their um and their fitness levels like the way that they can play um, but it's their it's, conditioning. It's two sets down in a quarter yeah, final. Like yeah. the, the, the mental and the physical element of any elite sport athlete is is so much higher than anyone else. I think we're also completely ignoring the the dedication and and commitment that all of these elite athletes are putting into their craft because um, we see a ninety minute football match and if they play rubbish life useless like i've completely lost it we see two races try and get the ball uh, off them yeah yeah you see two races of lewis hamilton in this season you're like he's 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 lost it he hasn't got a championship winning car look at him his 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 mentality's dipped down um but these guys have have kind of gone through this elite level of conditioning that it's never we're never going to experience what an entire season is like but that's just like not even the tip of the iceberg of these football players that have been playing from the age of six and a lot of them now are going into academy level at the age of eight or nine my nephew's 11 and one of his friends has already signed with a academy football club yeah, and it's early, yeah. basically been pulled out of recreational football yeah. he's not allowed to play with his friends now yeah um, it's and the that, same with F1, mate. Look, yeah, look, look, all the Red Bull and the all these academy teams. You ask, now. you ask professional football players, like, what are your happiest memories of playing football? A lot of them will say just playing in the park with my mates when yeah. I was about ten. Yeah, because it becomes their life yeah. that they then dedicate to. That a lot of people only see the tip of the iceberg of that ninety-minute football match, that three-set, five-set match, whatever, um, or that fifty laps in 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 Jeddah, and go, bloody hell. Norris has lost it, hasn't he? Yeah, I think that's analysis. Yeah, you're you're right. That trying to understand the intricacies of sport in general and also Formula One. But I, the the bit that bugs me is 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 <laughs> like the, the, is the yeah, is the the thought that it's simply impossible to comprehend what driving an F1 car must be like. And I know you love to mob me up, Tony, but I'm speaking from a teeny bit of experience, and I'm I'm just trying to tell you it's not 
as unfathomable as you think. And it's for us. No, no. I'm telling you from experience, it's it's not as unfathomable. I know I I know my experience was different. I know I did three laps. I know I wasn't fast, but I'm just <laughs> I'm just telling you the actual physical experience, which is what you think. Forget the sportsmanship side of it. The just purely the physicality or the experience of driving a Formula One car. So there's another company which Seb Delaney actually just did uh, an experience down in Portimao with, and they do. Uh, I think it's a Williams, a 2013 or 2012 Williams F1 car, driving experiences at four different tracks in Europe. Their top package I just checked, it's 10 laps, cost 17,000 euros. Wow. Now I reckon- Waste of money. I reckon, it's not a waste of money. I reckon- You should do it, sorry. Yes, so hold on a sec. If we really worked at this, and I'm actually gonna reach out to a couple of sponsors because I actually think there's something in this, and fully prepped you, I would talk about going to do Slicks and Wings track days, two or three Slicks and Wings track days in the UK, coaching on a simulator with Max Chilton, like all the prep. I reckon within those 10 laps, you could be within five or maybe three seconds of the back of the Formula One grid at that circuit. No way. No yep. chance. Yep. No way. No I do. chance. Yep. No way. Because... Firstly, I've seen Tony drive. <laughs> and secondly, whenever you do speak to professional racing drivers, they all say if you have the ability, and we see this with F2 drivers, with drivers from other series coming in to do random tests, the ability to get up to speed in a Formula One car, if you have experience, is not the hard part. The hardest part, supposedly, is the final second. The final Always second is, is what is what makes the difference, but even with teammates. And you can see it throughout the field, actually, that your baseline ability as a racing driver or a driver means that you can get into a Formula 1 car and after a period of time, you can get up to speed. But, but it's, three or it's, five seconds a lap is not getting up five to speed. Second, five seconds. You're miles off. Yeah, five seconds. But but you're you're going to get 10 laps in a Formula 1 car. 10 laps in a Formula 1 car. Enough. I think you, I think with enough prep, no chance. 10 laps of a Formula 1 car, you could get five seconds off the back of the field. If you are so determined to think that that's not correct, I'm willing to try and organise this. I don't, I, no chance. Okay. I don't, and I consider myself to be like half oh. decent. Put if some, I can make, some, if put, I can make some, it happen. Can you put some money on it, please? It, if you it'd be are, funny to see him lose it. If you are within I'd go five, out. if you are within oh, five yeah. seconds. Oh, we have to take this really seriously. Yeah, I really yeah. mean it, like proper prep. I don't think I've ever seen you road or track not go flat out. <laughs> 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 but if you lose, if you are within five seconds of the back of the field, so whoever qualified last, whatever their lap time was, we have to check on, I mean, also uh, era specific. No, I'm not talking about modern day F1 cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Era specific, five seconds. You then have to buy me the experience. So it'll cost you 17,000 euros. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that because I'll oh, no, sure you're gonna, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll slow down at the oh, final you'll, 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 Yeah, you'll see we'll right down at the end. Just lift off just yeah. before we cross the line. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't make it, Sam. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Too funny. Did you see a story that was doing the rounds and got a little bit of traction on Twitter? I think at the end of last week, which was that some insurers and now refusing to insure Range Rovers in London. Well, uh, I've, I mean, I've been hearing that for some time, mate, by the way. Well, it happened to my dad. Obviously, I think it's a sort of well-known story, <laughs> or, 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 or often told story on this podcast, that my dad had Range Rover Sports, was living in central London, and had three nicked in a row. Yeah. And for the third car, they said, I'm sorry, we now refuse to insure you. Yeah, he yeah. had to go through various, well, first like, okay, now you've got to put a tracker on, now you've got to have a steering wheel lock, now you've got to put, and then at the end it was like, well, if it's if it's not in an underground secure car park, we refuse to insure you. Yeah, And I think a lot of people, there was some traction because people were saying, I don't quite believe this is true, this can't be true. And I, it's I, it, definitely true. It, but f as I say, for sure, um, it, it I, I know it's true, and and the the story was written by journalists who had obviously found out that it was true. Um, but my question being, is this firstly, is this fair? Uh, let's talk about why it's come about, and where do we go from here? If you can not get your car, and if you live in a if a city and you're buying a hundred thousand pound car, and no one will insure it. What does that mean for us moving forward? Well, first of all, yes, it's completely fair. Um, because whilst you do pay your premiums for these cars, obviously insurance insurance is a business. So if it feels that 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 a car is more of a liability and it's costing them more money than it getting in, then yeah, they can they they'll pull the plug. the The fault lies with Land Rover. 
sort it out. You're the manufacturer because what's going to happen is no one. Will, I mean, it's already starting to happen now. People don't buy don't buy them anymore because I've got customers that literally do not buy Range Rovers. One for for liability. And they're one of my favourite cars in general. Range oh, yeah. I, I, I think I, we've said that so many times. We both really want a big Range Rover. Yeah, like, yeah. We both uh, really want a, one. It's an amazing bit of kit. But the general mass public get pissed off with spending 130, 140 grand on this car that's mostly in the garage or it's been stolen. So that's Land Rover's fault. That that's That's not the insurance company's fault or the person that's bought it. Land Rover got to sort their security system out because I have a bit of a conspiracy around cars being... Because it's not all manufacturers that suffer with the problem. Mercedes have got a big problem, by the way, with their Kili Century AMG stuff that gets nicked all the while. Um, but they must be getting the security systems on the cars, the Kili Century security systems on the cars, are either so easy to crack that they're just letting them get on with it. And actually, from a manufacturer point of view, yeah, let's let these cars will get stolen because it means we can just make some more. So there's there's that conspiracy theory. The other, the other theory is, is that the thieves are being sold the information from someone. It's like an inside job, which I think is that's what's happening. Someone, because there's some manufacturers that, that it's, not, it's not a thing. You can't, whether it, it's mostly Mercedes and Land Rover. Which is, hey, look, I love a conspiracy. Uh, um, I'm not going to knock either. Um, but you're right. It's bizarre that it's, it happens to be specific brands and models. But the crazier thing is Range Rovers specifically, uh, I think, are most often, well, if you go around central London, if it's not a Rolls Royce ghost, it's a Range Rover these days. So if most people feels like lots of Range Rover owners or customers are having their cars in the city centre and now insurers are saying, well, we're not actually going to insure you to have a car in the city centre. Is that market falling out from underneath Land Rover's eye? Like, as you said, they've got to fix it, but this has been going on for years, years, if not a decade. But, but it hasn't, it obviously hasn't affected their sales figures, but, no sooner it does, then they'll do something about it. Of but course. it might be too late. Yeah. The 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 fact of the matter is, we've seen the clips and we've seen everything on social media. It takes less than a minute to nick a Range Rover from a laptop without the key. Insane. I mean, that is a joke. So I smacked my, my side. <laughs> <laughs> I hit my microphone and it just flew across the table. Like, Where are you across going? the room. Yeah, I was like, oh, come back. Sorry, that got Yeah, I mean, when you can nick a hundred, it's too easy for the Vs. Yeah, it's too easy. It's too easy for them. And, so, and, we, and you don't hear anything else about Audi's VW Group, nothing like that? Well, on, on the list of most stolen cars in the country, um, Obviously, Range Rover. Do you want to get? A, do you want to factually check? This? Well, factually check, but I'm yeah. going to say it out loud because I won't be far off. I'm sure I never will. am. So, Range Rover will be there. Yeah. Audi S3 and Golf are in there, and AMG Mercedes. Okay, so this is the UK's most stolen cars. I love this. Range Rover Sport, Range Rover Autobiography, Land Rover Discovery, <laughs> Range Rover Vogue, <laughs> BMW X5. Okay, fair. Range Rover Evoque, Mercedes Benz E Class. Yeah. Um, Mercedes-Benz GL, Mercedes-Benz S-Class, Mercedes-Benz GLC, and then Audi A4 and BMW M3. BMW M3? I'm guessing that's not new. I well, bet that's an old generation M3. Well, it should be, because most of them are not keyless entry. The, uh, not, the, not all the M3s are keyless entry cars. So this is a different article. This is from last year. E-Class, 800 were stolen last year. Vauxhall Astra, 1,000 were stolen. Vauxhall Corsa, 1,200. Land Rover Discovery, 1,200. BMW 3 Series, 1,400. C-Class, Mercedes, 1,400. Volkswagen Golf, 1,700. Ford Focus, 1,900. Range Rover, 3,754. Yeah. But topping the list, according to whatcar.com, Ford Fiesta, 3,900 stolen. Mm. But, uh, fair. <laughs> That's a joke between number two, Range Rover 3,700, to number three. Uh, yeah. It's the Ford Focus at 1,900. I mean, anyway, I mean, yes, long story short, y y you are essentially right, but there are a few other models in there. But 
Hey, I, as you say, it's something that I guess potential customers or owners are going to be considering more and more because we all need to have our cars insured in the UK. And so if you can't get insurance, you're going to have to be thinking about that. On the final day that I had choice, I decided to go on Google and do a bit of a heritage search and just start flicking through some old school 911s just to see if there were some other heritage colours that I hadn't quite remembered because it's quite hard online going through the palettes and picking the colours and seeing how they look. And they never life. look the same as never well on the, the configurator. So I discovered a colour on an old 930 Turbo called Ice Green Metallic. Right. And this is a super light, desaturated silvery green and i was like oh i quite like that and is this your is this your gt silver compromise yes so oh. i was like this is a this is like a gt silver with a bit of green but not too in your face so i was like and i like that it's nice I, I like the heritage like i was like oh i like this and i found some older 911s as well f- with ice cream metallic. so i immediately pop on the pts list i'm looking like no ice cream metallic so i'm like Ugh. So I've sent an email. Yeah, that you can have ice cream metallic, but it's the PTS plus. It's an extra 10K. It's an extra six months waiting time. And I was like, no, I don't like it that much. I'll have gentian, thank you. <laughs> a bunch but, of gentian. Literally. But I sent a message to the legend that is Luke, make green great again. And, uh, and had a bit of a chat with him. Uh, by this way, this is Luke Gilbertson from uh, DK Engineering. Uh, and I was like, look, help me out because he's the master of green colors. And stumbled upon... Racing green metallic. Metallic. Racing green metallic. Right. Previously known as Aston Martin racing green metallic or Aston Martin green metallic. So is, that, is, it, uh, is it a dark green or? No, it is. Think of the green on a sort of DBR9 or a sort of light vantage green. You know, it's, it's an... It is an Aston Martin colour. It's not a rich, deep, dark British racing green. It's that kind of metallic-y liquid Aston Martin colour. I can only explain it as an Aston Martin colour. If you think green racing Aston Martins, that's the colour. And, and I was like... And you like that colour? I was like, yeah. I was like, that's pretty good. What's, what's, what's the story with that? Did some research. A couple of cars in America had been spec with it, like a couple. None of them to my identity. There was a touring, had the wrong wheels. There was a wing car, which had a few bits that I didn't want. It's like, I couldn't quite get to grips with it. But I was like, well, that color looks good. But the problem was it looked different in every single lighting situation, inside and out, it always looked different. So I couldn't get a gist of it. It's a problem, mate. Such a problem. So the very last thing I did before I pulled the trigger, and I had the pressure now, right, you're going, whatever. And I was basically <laughs> stuck with gentian blue or racing green metallic. And I spoke to another friend of mine who's big into the Porsche world. And I said, this is where I'm at. And as I said, Racing Green Metallic, he went, oh my God, that's how I spec my GT4 RS. I went, no way. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I spec my GT4 RS. And I know a Porsche family member at the board who's also got a touring coming in that color. It's a very important and well-chosen color and very rare color. And there was something, something in what he said at that moment. And I went, Maybe I should stop fighting green. Maybe I should stop being like, social media have ever done it. I've only ever had green Porsches. I love green. And this is a very different green. This is not the green that you've seen on 992 GT3s. It's not the deep, dark, saturated British racing green, oak green metallic, underberg green. You know, it's not that. It's a very different colour. And so, emailed Russell. And I said, Russell, we're going racing green metallic <laughs> so there you go boys and girls i can confirm that is the color of my 992 gt3 which will be revealed on the main channel this sunday there is still lots of other things to show you a couple of real interesting other elements when it comes to the spec we did not hold back the color was just one element of what i ended up doing with the car um there's also something which having seen the car delivered I slightly regret. Have you seen the car? Yeah. And I think I might need to change something. That's it's quite a bit bad, late now. It? No, it was not. Something, oh. It's something that could be changed. Right, I haven't. Yeah, well, let's see. So.